Hello, I'm Blair, and welcome to Cellar Notes. Today we're going to be talking about the wonderful world of scotch. And joining us is Marion Downer, General Manager of Vinacopia. Thank you for being here. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, Blair. Uh, she will be our expert of the day on scotches. Um, first of all, Marion, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started in the business, where you've been, what you've been doing. I started selling beverage alcohol from a wholesale standpoint uh, in early 1980s, 1982 to be exact, and have just gone right through the, through the system, I guess. Various wholesale houses, uh, supplier rep for a few years, and um, ultimately just ended up starting with uh, Vinacopia and putting the book together there. Wonderful. Let's jump right into scotch. Um, first of all, fill us in a little bit about the history of scotch. How did it originate, uh, where, you know, where it developed, and, and where, where it's come to now? Certainly scotch has been produced for centuries, I would assume, in small home-based distilleries, but only in the early 1800s did it become a viable branded product, and that's when England fell in love with it. Um, and it's gone on to become what it is today, um, very well-known big distilleries, but still very small handcrafted products. There has to be hundreds or thousands of these little handcrafted uh, facilities all around Scotland, I'm sure. Hundreds would be better. There's about 200 today. Really? Okay. Correct. Um, let's get right into how it's made, uh, the process. What makes Scotch Scotch and not beer, not bourbon, but Scotch? First off, it has to be made in Scotland. Uh, and it has to be three things, barley, water, and yeast. End of the story. It's how it's handled that makes it distinctly okay. Scotch. Uh, barley is, of course, a dry, dead seed, so it needs to be steeped in water for about six days just to begin germination. Once that germination starts, they need, however, to stop it um, because if it were to continue, it would eat all the nutrients within the right. seed. So that's when the barley is then taken to the kilns and spread on, on uh, screens under which is a heat source that then dries the grain and stops that germination process. At that time, the um, uh, barley is then taken into um, the mashed mash house and mm -hmm. mixed with hot water so a sugary liquid is produced. That's what then is fermented. Once it's fermented, it goes to the still. During that drying process is when some of this peatiness that can uh, overtake okay. scotch or become so prevalent in scotch might happen. Uh, the heat source is today, of course, just a gas jet usually. But in a directly dried uh, product, that being where peat is used, a a, a bale of peat or kelp is put over that heat source and it's moistened so it smolders and makes this peat aroma that then is of course going into the grain and becomes part of the final product. Wonderful. So the, the barley isn't actually cooked, it's not roasted in for example no. say a beer, but rather it absorbs some of the flavors of whatever's used in the drying process before it goes into the mash. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And then after it comes out of the mash, and it goes there, where does it go after it becomes alcohol then? Okay, during the, the fermentation, which is when the sugar in the grain turns to alcohol mm -hmm. and makes a wine, so to speak, it goes to the still. And the first distillation will produce a low wine, or what's called a low wine. And then it goes to the second distillation, which is the spirits distillation process, where it will go up to about 63% or 120 maybe about 140 proof, and then after that it's, it's watered back to about 125 proof before it goes into the barrel. Um, let's talk a little bit about the differences. Um, the two that I think everybody is most familiar with would be a blended scotch or a single malt scotch. Can you explain what the difference is and, and if there's difference in, in the processes or how that works? The process to start with wouldn't vary wouldn't at all because same. a blend has to start with, with single malts. So single malts simpl simply means that it's all from one distillery. So if you have something that in this case has Deanston on it, 100% of that was produced at Deanston Distillery and, and then aged. Uh, so a single malt is just that. It's malted at one or produced at one distillery. To be a blend, it is a blend of many scotches, a toward a house style. A, a blended scotch would choose its house style, purchase from the distilleries, from the single distilleries, the amount of scotch that they want to put in there to achieve a certain house style, and then it's blended with a certain percentage of grain neutral spirit that mm. really doesn't have any 
distinct flavor, so to speak. Although it is three years old, it has to be three to be a scotch, but it's in there. So 20 to, um, well, 15 to 25, 30 percent of the final blend will be single malt. The rest will be grain neutral. Very nice. Um, there's, uh, oh, the one other thing that, that I've heard around the store, and I know that, that's been asked, uh, is the uh, vatted malts. Uh, or vatted bats. What, what, there's single malt and then there's vatted malt. What is exactly a vatted malt? A vatted malt is simply a blend of nothing but single malts. In other words, a blend, but minus that grain neutral base. Okay, so it, it's, it's, it's the same but different in the fact that there's no neutral spirits added. Correct, it's 100% single malt, okay. but, but a variety of them. Is it labeled that way then? Yes, okay. we'll say vatted malt. Um, let's talk about the regions. Um, obviously, Scotland is an island. There's seashore, there's inland, there's highlands, lowlands. What are some of the, the more famous regions, uh, and can you give us uh, some examples and stuff? Highland would be uh, the most prevalent, I believe, and it is the medium-bodied scotch, not too peaty, not too salty, not too, not too anything. A very good place to well begin rounded, drinking. Well-rounded, right in the yeah, middle? right of? in the middle. Deanston is an example of that, and that is in the, from the highlands. Then there are lowlands, which we don't have any of here today. Um, they tend to be a bit more, a bit lighter in, in uh, body and in flavor. Then there's Campbelltown, which is usually very big. And then the islands, which tend to be very peaty, or can be very peaty or not, and a little smoky and more salty, more of that medicinal flavor that many people will describe. Bunnahaven is uh, an example of that, where Bunnahaven is from the island of Isla and is um, the lightest of them. A uh, Lafroig would be at the other end, at the most peaty smoky. And then Tobermory and Ladag from the Isle of Mull. Okay. Um, we, t we touched on this just a little bit, but there are uh, lots of scotches you'll see that have uh, numbers on them aging, ten, five year, 10 year, 12 year, 18, 25, 30, et cetera, et cetera. What exactly is the process for the aging? Are there requirements? I'm sure there is. And what kind of barrels are used or or is there a difference? Well, in order to be scotch, and we did touch on that, it has to be three years aged right. in oak barrels. That, that's the very minimum. And at that point, many of them may become part of, the blend, part of a blend with a blended okay. scotch. But to go on, only about 5% of scotch ever distilled does go on to receive a single malt designation with an age statement. And typically, it's going to be more than 10 if an age statement is made. So Deanston, as a for instance here, Deanston 12, unchill filtered, has spent 12 years, its entire life, in a bourbon barrel, ex-American bourbon barrel. Mm. Um, bourbon barrels can be used only one time in the United States, so they are sold to many countries for, and other dis, uh, types of distillation right. to, for the aging of their, of their product, and that's certainly true in Scotland. So its entire 12 years, it's spent there. Um, during that time, to about 2% of it disappeared, went to the angels uh, each year. So at the end of the 12 years, they're missing about 25, 30% of the scotch because it's gone out. That's a lot. That's a lot, you're absolutely right. But during that time also, the local atmosphere has gone into the barrel. Angels share out local atmosphere in. That's why scotch is really such a product of its environment, uh, of the barrel, of the air, the whole terroir thing comes into play with mm -hmm. scotch. The Bunnahavans, for instance, then are from the island. This one is 12 years old, this one is 18, and they're very, very different, a lot more different than just six years in wood would be. The 12-year-old, 90% of it spent its entire life in a bourbon barrel. 10% of it spent its entire life in an Oloroso sherry cask. At oh. the end of the 12, it was put together and bottled. The 18, 65% of it was in Oloroso sherry and 35% in a bur bourbon barrel, so it's going to be sweeter, maybe a little darker in color, um, have that personality. This one, the Tobermory, a 15-year-old, spent 14 years in an American bourbon barrel and one year in an um, in Oloroso sherry cask. Ladag, uh, the only directly dried one we have here today, spent its entire life, in uh, entire 10 years in a bourbon barrel. Oh, okay. So they're entirely different and certainly um, their final uh, personality or expression is definitely largely due to the time it's spent aging. Wonderful. Um, 
from my experience, and I, I want to know if you agree with me, I find scotches and the enjoyment of scotches similar uh, in, in like enjoying a wine. Um, there's a bouquet, there's a nose, there's a color, a clarity, there's a body, a flavor, there is a, a finish, an aftertaste, and I think that scotch drinkers and wine drinkers approach their specific uh, likes in, in the same kind of manner. Would you agree with that? Or? Absolutely, because there are people who prefer things to be a bit sweeter. Um, as something is, when it's younger, it has a lot more distinct flavors. As it becomes older, it becomes more what I call congruous. The, the flavors come together a lot more and, and create uh, maybe a more full and uh, rich spirit, but not quite as edgy. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose the same might be true of wine. And uh, the nose certainly does affect um, the final appreciation sure. of the scotch. So certainly something that is peaty and seaweedy is going to appeal to one part of the population and something a little sweeter to another one. So certainly that's true. Okay, here's the question that I'm sure you've been dreading, but I have to ask it because it gets asked all the time. I have a bottle of 12-year-old scotch. I bought it six years ago and let it sit in my house. Do I now have an 18-year-old bottle of scotch? No, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> the bottle is 18 years old. You're absolutely, or the scotch is 18 years old. That's probably about all you can say. <laughs> but uh, the personality did not change once it went into the bottle. It uh, continues to change only in the barrel. Okay. And when it gets put into the bottle, that's when it stops progressing, you might say. So if you kept this for eight years, you, or six years, you don't have an 18-year-old scotch. I usually tell people, you have a 12-year-old scotch, you cheated yourself after six years. <laughs> um, along with that, um, I noticed that, that a lot of these are cork-filled, and, and it extends, the cap extends over the lip of the glass. Is that, does that have to do with keeping the freshness of the scotch, uh, keeping it from evaporating, or? It does, and um, contrary, you made the correlation to wine. Mm -hmm. Wine, you want to lie on its side so that the, the, the cork remains wet and, mm -hmm. and uh, moist in the air and, scot and wine don't, don't interchange or exchange. In the case of scotch, if you did that, the alcohol would eat the cork and you'd ruin oh. the whole bottle. So yes, the, the cap does extend over the glass, which creates a seal, so evaporation shouldn't happen. You can leave this open and in your cupboard, preferably not in, in a lighted area, or, but certainly in your cupboard or your back bar uh, for years, almost forever, and it really won't change. If you were to open this bottle, a new bottle, uh, alongside of one you opened a couple of years ago, you might notice a slight difference in change or in flavor, but very, very little. Okay. Um, finally, I, I would like to know from you, what is the best way to enjoy a scotch? Certainly drink it, <laughs> um, rather than leave it standing in, Don't in leave your it sitting cupboard. for six years. <laughs> That's right. But uh, I usually will quote Ian McMillan, who is a master distiller of all these uh, products that are standing on the counter today. And he says to take an ounce to an ounce and a half of the, of the scotch, mm -hmm. mix it with a half an ounce to three quarter ounce of room temperature water, and just sip it. Uh, the water causes it to open up, to release more of its aromas and flavors, and make it much more enjoyable, uh, especially if they're higher proof you want to put a bit of water in it to bring it down mm -hmm. to make it more easily uh, easily enjoyed. Very nice. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Marion. I really appreciate uh, you, you being here with us. And uh, thanks for being with us here on Solar Notes. Mm -hmm.